you academically and still maintain the the level that you're at. So I don't know. The world is changing. It, it, it doesn't feel like you're supposed to do just one thing anymore, right? Um, so I think this, this is getting deep, Christian. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another C Squared podcast. We are here after the US Chess Championships conclusion with the two champions, Fabiano Caruana and Carissa Ip. Carissa, welcome to Thank the pod. Thank you. Thanks for having me. First time on the pod, maybe not the last time uh, also. <laughs> it's good to have you. You're one of the most exciting female chess players that came uh, from the United States in the past few decades. So um, definitely an honor for us to have you. I'm happy to be here. Tell us a bit about uh, the championship. Let's start with the champions. Who wants to start? Oh, Chris, you go first. <laughs> you had a crazy finish. <laughs> oh my why, gosh. why don't we start with that? Yeah, I mean, I was just... I guess we could go through how I found out. Um, so after I lost, I was super disappointed in myself because, you know, I could have drawn at any point in the game. Um, and for some reason, I kind of lost my mind, blundered B5 there. And I was just really kicking myself for, you know, not making the right decision when it came down to it and uh, taking the draw. And so, you know, I was not happy. No one was really happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I'm just like, wallowing in my bed thinking about what ice cream i'm gonna gouge on later that night and i get this call from like a spam caller i'm like who's this so i decline the call they call again like, okay pick up and it turns out to be uh caleb from the club mm -hmm. he's like chris it looks like jennifer's about to win so you have to come back to the studio i was like what's happening but you know i went back um i think on my way there began resigned so it was official and i was still in so much shock and that's also uh, kind of funny because even if you wanted to you still wouldn't be able to follow everything that was happening because we had a 30 minute delay so basically you look at the game and they're still playing maybe begging is still winning or still better because she was winning from the beginning of the game yeah um, i took a look at the position before i left um and you know there's just looked like there's so much stress on yeah. both players because everything's on the line there and um yeah i think the position looked really complicated but i also noticed jennifer was lower on time than begum and i didn't really want to follow along because <laughs> i get super nervous watching people's games yeah no that was actually i would say one of the most exciting finishes crazy finishes that i've got to commentate on um at least at the us champs i mean just one second basically could have decided that tournament maybe less than a second of course we're talking you you saw that moment right yeah, no, I'm actually interested in like what, when you were playing in the final game and you made that decision to not go for a draw, was that because you generally always want to play for a win or was it because of the tournament situation you thought you had to win to secure first place? Um, honestly, I do feel that I usually always sort of overpress for a win, even if it's not necessary. Um, in my last big tournament, I was playing World Juniors and, you know, there's one round where I could have taken a draw as well. Um, but I declined it, and then I ended up losing, and I was like half a point back in the standings, um, and it just really set me back in the tournament, and <laughs> I really should have learned my lesson then, but, you know, when it came down to it, I feel like sort of my instincts took over, and I just felt that I really wanted to win, um, I really wanted to sort of secure the title without a playoff, and I was looking at Red Begum's game, you know, while my game was still going on, and again, super complicated position, but I felt that she should be doing well because she had, like, you know, these two past pawns. Um, and I was like, it's not looking really great for me right now. Um, <laughs> so I guess I better finish well, which I did not. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned the World Juniors because uh, at the World Juniors, you played against one of my students, uh, Bella, and you played these four nights. And then in the last round of the US yeah. Champs, she decided to play the four nights against you. And by the way, in that game, got a losing position out of the opening, but that's because you forgot what you were supposed to do, I would assume. Uh, it's such a complex line. And you did play one of the most aggressive ones. And if you do know a little bit more in that, then you can put some pressure on black. Um, what was your thought process, I guess, when you saw four knights in the last round? You know, after... Because you deviated, you played yeah. this knight DB5. After my game against your student, your students have been causing me some problems. <laughs> <laughs> but... After that game, I was like, 
um i was really worried about anyone playing the four nights against me because i was like it kind of showed that you know my theory's not great in that line and so uh, i didn't really have that much time to check up on it and when i faced the four nights again i knew that night b5 the best move for black is to sort of just transpose into a sveshnikov mm -hmm. um and I also knew that like bishop c5 and bishop b4 just weren't really great options for black. Well, um, bishop b4 is is okay, um, but you just have to know it. I, <laughs> you suffer. I, you I suffer. Had, <laughs> I had a, a look at them both at some point, but it, it, the four knights in general is is a very very tough opening. I have some similar experiences as as you just mentioned, playing and and not being able to find any ideas in the four knights. So I, I understand the struggle. You had that nice game at the World Cup, right? Um, Bishop oh yeah, that's that's yeah. Right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Bishop f4. Yeah, I remember. I was looking at that line, and so I was spending a lot of time in the opening because I was like, I might know some stuff in Bishop f4, and I was like, I don't want to risk it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you haven't checked it that morning, that's like that's a super crazy line for anyone to play. Yeah, so I thought I thought knight b5 would be a safe bet. I knew that like this whole knight d6, Bishop f4, e5, knight f5 is really good for white. Um, I think after Bishop. G5, I just had to find bishop c4, and then white's doing really well. But kind of got into my head a bit, and I said I should employ, like, you know, this setup with uh, taking on f6, two knights controlling d5, and I felt that that would be an unlosable position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you guys have completely different events, right? Yours felt like smooth sailing, basically very comparable to last year. Yeah, I think it was definitely because... Uh in mine, it felt like people were struggling to kind of make strides. And then you and Begum were both like tearing through the event. Like four rounds before the end, it was like it, it was, nobody else could had had any chance, right? Even before that, it was kind of clear that crazy. But, and and then it was just a question of like who would win this race. But it was it was definitely exciting to watch. How <laughs> how would you have felt in case of a playoff? In case you had to play a playoff against Begum? Man, if I had to do a playoff, have like another day of prep, and then. Super stressful chess, because you know, rapid stresses me out. <laughs> Quick chess usually does. Um, I don't know. Wouldn't have been too happy about that, especially, you know, given my our standings going into the last round. I think she also would have had like a psychological edge for being able to bounce back and Catch force up. that playoff. Yeah. Um, but I think overall, I would have liked my chances in the playoff. Uh, rapid is one of my better time controls. And, you know, I feel confident enough in my openings and my prep. I think I would have been okay. Actually, I just want to expand a bit on what you, what you just mentioned when you talked about, the, like, the psychological edge. Because I'm wondering if it's, like, more of a psychological edge to come back or if maybe after coming back you feel like the job is done and then you still have to play this other whole other thing. Mm -hmm. So you kind of maybe relax a bit early. Like, she wins a game, she, come, she gets back into it, but still, like, she has this huge final hurdle. So it, maybe it's, like, psychologically kind of complicated as well. Yeah, I think, honestly, in that position, usually I'm just, you know, I never really assume that if I'm, like, half a point behind that my opponent's going to lose and I could leapfrog. I always feel like, you know, it's going to come down to tie breaks or playoff or something, and just being able to be in that position makes me, um, you know, it kind of, like, rejuvenates me for, for that next set of games and to ensure that I can finish well there. I guess the way you have to look at it is just you put yourself in this position. Sure, maybe you've lost some ground in the last round, but you still put yourself in that position going into the last round, which is already a, a win, right? And competition is never smooth. Like, there's always something that goes wrong in every single tournament. You just have to adjust, basically. Um, speaking of those last rounds, they have different rules, it feels like, right? Um, a player that usually doesn't do well in the event, suddenly can have a great tournament and beat the top leader, yeah? Um, Once nerves get into it. What yeah. is it about those nerves of the last yeah, round? Yeah, I, I think it's really the nerves. It's, I don't, some people are more immune, some people are, are, are less immune to it, but everyone uh, is prone to messing up in those like, really stressful moments. That's, that's my feeling. Mm. Yeah, and that actually happened in Norway, yeah, uh, with yeah. you as well, more yes. or less. <laughs> that, that was just nerves. I basically. remember. <laughs> uh, how did you, speaking of nerves, that miss Rook to D1 in those last few moments, and you played it more or less fast. What happened there? Um, you know, I think I was sort of calculating this position ever since I played Rook D1. Um, 
you know, and allowed her pawn to get to the second rank there. And I, I spent all my time. Um, I had, you know, probably a couple minutes left when I made my blunder. And I was just so, so like ultra focused on one line that I wasn't giving enough thoughts to sort of Black's other options. And once I played it, I was like, oh my God, you know, she has like Rick D1 instead of, you know, something like taking on G1 and playing Rick F6, those sorts of things. Um, or Rick F6 immediately, which was all that I was calculating. And I think there it's like an interesting line because White's two connected passers are fast enough. But, and I was like, oh my gosh, got when, this in the bag. And then <laughs> and I was like, when did you God. realize it? When you played B5, did you immediately realize I it? I played B5, looked at the position, and I was like, wait a second. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and I was still like a little bit in shock then, I think, because it like hadn't fully processed. And I had this rationale for playing B5. I knew that it was like a risky choice. And I was like, you know what? If it turns out this variation is losing, then like I don't even deserve to be <laughs> winning or like being the U.S. Women's Champion because I can't make the right choices under uh, pressure. How do you rationalize, rationalize that pressure, those nerves? Like, what do you do to adjust to it? Do you have any techniques, both of you? Um, like, what works individually for you? Uh, let me let me think. Yeah, it's it's definitely experience helps, but mm -hmm. um, like the first time you have to, you're fighting for. I feel like this is also with titles. Like the first time when you're fighting for a title and you're trying to get your norms is always the most difficult. And then once you finally get your final norm, then suddenly you get like a bunch in a row. That's that's how it mm -hmm. happened with me every time. It's like something about either the pressure of it or the accomplishment after. So like, do you feel like because you've already won the, uh, the US championship that it's easier the second time around? Was it harder the first time for you? Um, I think the tournament was easier for me the first time around and with in and a half, which was the same score. But, you know, no one was putting that sort of pressure on me and also playing super well. Um, but yeah, definitely I felt there wasn't as much pressure. You know, after I lost, I was sort of like, it's okay, I already won the championship once and I would have been, I would have been so distraught if, you know, I never won before and I just like given up my chance for the title. Um, yeah. I have a memory from, I think it was from your first win. Was that where you beat Nazi in one of the last rounds with the uh, hip hippo? hippo? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, I've noticed that a lot of your openings are very risky, very double-edged. Is that, do you just like that? Or is that just because that's what you learned uh, when you were younger? Mm, I just really like, you know, these setups with Fian Chenoi, my bishop. So King's Indian, it's one of my favorites. Um that game against Nazi when I played the hippo, I actually, I didn't think she would transpose into, uh, you know, a modern step with e4 and no c4. And so she caught me off guard and I was like, oh my God, she tricked me into the hippo. <laughs> this is not going to be good. Um, but yeah, I, I think that was not one of my best games, but she, I think she tried to break through a little bit too soon. She then, gave you a lot of pawns. You had like four connected pass pawns. Yes. <laughs> that was, yeah. That must have been satisfying. <laughs> No, it was good. I think she blended with F4 or something. Mm -hmm. And when I saw on the board, I was like, thank goodness. Because I didn't know what my next move was going to be. Yeah. Uh, we started with your most difficult moment of the tournament. What was yours? Most difficult? I think maybe after I didn't win against Shanky. Mm. Uh, against Sam Shankland. Uh, and I really was like completely winning. Yeah, yeah. And after that, I had to play Hans. <laughs> and I, I understood that it would be a tough game because Hans really wanted to win. I could, I could tell. And uh, so I knew that would be a tough game. So definitely leading up to that game, that was the hardest moment. Mm. Was it the disappointment? Because it's kind of like uh, not that difficult of a pill to swallow for the simple fact that, in fact, with that draw, you increased your lead in the tournament. You went from half a point because Hans lost that round. Yeah. So it was kind of uh, you, you were in both boats, more or less. You were feeling good that now you're one point in the lead. You were also feeling bad that you just made draw with a plus three advantage. Yeah. I, I looked at all the results and I was like, everything couldn't have gone better except for what I did to, <laughs> in my own game. But everything else was perfect. I mean, like, yeah, Hans Hans losing when he was trailing me by half a point and he was like right on, on, on my tail. And everyone else, nobody like pushing forward besides that. So that was like a bit better. 
I didn't feel like huge pressure, but it was still disappointing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's the most difficult one. Before the last round, did you have any, let's say, weak moments? Even if during a game you felt like, oh, I'm so completely losing, I'm hopeless, stuff like that. Okay. Or those thoughts. I know you're referencing my game against Atusa. During that game. I was, yes, <laughs> there we go. Let's talk about that. During that game, I actually thought I was like doing okay. I knew I was worse, but I felt that the position was like sufficiently complex enough that I would be able to confuse her a bit. Mm -hmm. That ended up happening. But I would say probably my worst moment of the tournament wasn't when, you know, I thought I lost the title, but it was when, <laughs> it was after my game against Nazi when I drew. Um, and I was just, you know, completely winning. I think out of the opening and into like the early middle game, I just had such a great position. I was up a pawn. Um, her king was a bit weak, had the two bishops, you know, every sort of possible advantage. And um, I just blew it. I kind of let her back into the game and she had this like unexpected defense by bringing her queen into the king, uh, queen side. And after that game, you know, Begum won a really nice game against Ru Yang. Mm -hmm. Ru Yang was actually like one of my um, main hopes for stopping Begum because I was like, she's a draw machine. She's draw. good. She Ru is. is good. No, yeah. she's such a good player. Um, and she was just drawing everyone, playing solid chess. And I was like, she's got this. My girl won't let me down. <laughs> <laughs> what she did. <laughs> but that, <laughs> but that game against Nazi, it wasn't like I, when I was watching it live, I was like, yeah, you're just going to, this is the game is over. You have two bishops and everything. But then when I s looked at it after with an engine, it was like, this is not so simple. And she has that G4 H3 around your king and like your king's also. So I was a bit surprised that, uh, that it's not as easy as it looks. Did yeah. you also feel like you were super, super close to winning that one? I, honest, I thought I was like breezing after I took on c5 um but yeah she had this she had this really nice idea with g4 h3 which i really underestimated and then um queen e7 bringing the queen back to the uh to defend her pawns and you know the end game wasn't super clear for me after i didn't immediately exchange queens um so yeah that one was surprising to me i remember i also looked at it with the engine and it was like maybe plus Two. It was like the bad engine on chess 24, mm -hmm. so I wasn't trusting too much into its depth. Um, but yeah, it was a little unclear, but I, you know, I also felt that <laughs> this is a super easy position. Um, I don't know, I couldn't shake that vibe off. So I was really disappointed in myself. I kind of felt that I let everything slip, and I kind of thought that that game was going to go two out of two, and I'll be, you know, done for. Um, so then, so then I was so, <laughs> so upset. Um, I was, yeah, I don't think I really did that much. I, I should have like been prepping and stuff, but I was being sad watching Netflix. <laughs> you know, there were a few times when I raged by hitting things with my pillow. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Okay. That's the range. I like it. Is yeah. that how you get your frustration out in general? Like, do you need an outlet for it? Like sports or, or hit, hitting something with a pillow? This was my first time actually, you know, I was... Just looked at my pillow and was like, I have to hit something, but I, I don't like actually like destroying things. So like if I just hit a bunch of things with my pillow, they'll all be fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's interesting. You, you both said that the most difficult moment of the tournament was a draw. Sometimes those are the most frustrating, right? Especially the ones when you're completely winning and you're like, this was all my mistake. I've done this so many times. I've won this type of position so many times effortlessly. And then uh, I don't do it maybe because of nerves. It doesn't feel that bad when, you, you know, you lose a game. Maybe your opponent just played good. Obviously, uh, it doesn't feel good, but it's not the same. It's not as frustrating. That's interesting. Um, how do you hype yourself back up after you externalize your emotions by hitting stuff? <laughs> <laughs> um, what do I really do? Honestly, this is like a question that I've still been trying to figure out. But mostly once I get my frustration out i'm kind of like okay torment's not over yet um there's still you know a lot to play for i it's not gonna go two out of two all i have to do is make sure i play well you know you know she does go 10 out of 11 if i can match her pace then at least i'll gain a ton of rating mm. <laughs> so you always find uh, the uh full side of the cup yeah i try the empty one how about you no, I think it's like if, if someone's going 10 out of 11 and I don't win because of that, that feels better than if, let's say, nobody's on form and 
and I just didn't play well myself. Right. But if I'm having a great tournament and someone just, like in 2018 when, when Sam won, mm -hmm. and I had a good tournament, I was like, okay, I mean, I did the best I could for the most part, and Sam just had like an amazing event. It feels a bit better, like at least you were fighting for it the, the you did whole your way. Best. Yeah, you did your, especially if you win like your last few games, because those are the most critical ones, right? And then the other person also wins all their games. Like, okay, what can you do, right? Yeah. You, you did what you had to do, it just didn't pan out. I feel like this rarely happens for you, Fabi, because in like a tournament, I'm always sort of replaying my worst moments. There are like so many positions where, you know, I should have been able to convert. I should have been able to like hold a draw, that, that sort of thing. I feel like your play is always like super precise. So you're like, yeah, no, I've, I I, I've messed up enough to I, <laughs> I've, I've had I've had plenty of those those times, too. Yeah, a lot of but that's like normal for like there's no way to avoid it. I think everyone has those those moments when. They're um, they're just yeah. Either they they choke at the last minute, or or someone just plays better. I mean, we all have those painful memories. It's <laughs> what can you do about it? There's also the good memories, so you got to balance those out, I guess. But I have to say, I think precision was definitely on your side this tournament. We were looking at. I mean, I was doing commentary, and we were looking at all of your games with the engine, and it was so precise. Um, and it felt like that throughout the year. We've traveled to Norway together. I've watched your games closely, and in most of them, I've seen a lot of precision. Do you feel that that's coming back as well? Not really. Mm. I don't know. I, I wasn't feeling that. But first hand doesn't feel uh, as 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 powerful, huh? Yeah, that's that's not that wasn't my impression. But I I think I'm creating chances as well. That's the main thing I've been doing, and mm. not always taking them, but at least creating them. That's the the first step. Right. Second step is to actually take them. That's uh, <laughs> can't do everything right. What did you feel? Um, went right, went wrong this tournament for you? Um, did you feel uh, you've got some luck or maybe you felt that you were precise throughout your victories? Oh, for sure. Luck was on my side. Um, you know, I think leading... Let's say accept that game against Tatusa. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Accept that game. Um, you know, I would say things sort of balanced out somewhat. I missed, like, um, you know, I was... Round one, I was like totally lost against Irina, managed to fight back, and then I was winning. Didn't manage to find the win, and then we drew, so I was like, okay, that seems reasonable. Um, next few games were good against Begum. I didn't realize that that would be like probably my most important game of the mm. tournament. <laughs> mm. And, you know, I think I missed like some chances for a big advantage in the middle yeah. game, and then at the end, I could have, uh, I think, won outright in the end game, and I totally misplayed that as well. Um, and you know, I was, a, I was a little upset after that game, but I was like, it's okay. I think I'm playing good chess. Um, and then let me think. Yeah. I should have lost that game against Atusa. Um, probably should have won against Nazi. Shouldn't, should have drew against Rui Yang. Mm. So, you know, score oh, kind yeah, of for sure. evens itself out in the end. It balances itself out. Yeah, I have this distorted view uh, sometimes because I watch everything with the engine. Yeah, whenever you're outside, like spectators, chess fans in general, whenever they watch games, they always watch it with the engine, and then you get this distorted view. You don't understand the feelings that go into a game. Yeah, right? I honestly feel like, sorry, at my level, not your level, of course, Bobby, um, but a lot of the time it's about getting a practical edge, getting like a position where you can fight for chances because I know my opponent's not going to find like you know the top engine moves and just kill me. And that's like part of why I play the King's Indian because my engine hates it. But, you know, I know that it gives me good attacking chances as black and it's hard to actually face that over the board. Um, I, I think this is applicable to, to most levels though. Like the, the practice, actually there's a game of yours that I was impressed by that I feel, I actually want to ask you about it. Your game against Ana, which was near the end. It felt like, because she was a little bit in shaky form, that, like, watching it during the game, that you were trying to put the pressure on. Did you feel like her psychological uh, vulnerability or, or like, the, the practical element of it during that game? I think, um, you know, I wasn't focusing too much on her tournament. I knew that she hadn't played great, but mostly, you know, I know Anna as a player, we played a few times. I knew that if I, like, sort of applied the right amount of pressure in the right place and then she would eventually crack under that and so my goal in that game was to you know not take any big risk because i'm not I'm not trying to lose and 
uh, you know, set myself back further. But, and I was okay with a drop, but I felt that, you know, I should kind of make her work for it a little bit. So some practical chances. Um, but that game was also a little risky because I think she had some moment. She could play queen c5. All of my pawns are falling. Um, but luckily didn't happen <laughs> but you also had the time match like a big time match right yeah that, i think that gives you a buffer in case anything goes wrong as well yes i i think that was also uh you know partially anna kind of gets into time trouble a lot and that was also why i was you know trying to put the pressure on because i know that she'll overthink um and you know eventually we'll get to a position where she can't find the right moves how do you juggle that factor um the time trouble situation you know that some of your opponents and I want to talk about that game against uh, Darius. Not an easy game. Didn't get a good position out of the opening with the white pieces, but still you had that in the back of your mind that if you get the position complicated, if you keep it complicated going into the first and the second time control, he will probably get into some uh, sort of danger because of his time situation. How do you juggle that? Yeah, I have some experience playing Daru, and I feel like time trouble is definitely one of his uh, weaknesses. That he plays very well, but he does tend to get into time trouble. So that's something that that you can use. And that's also why I thought of your game against Ana. Because it's like, if you know someone gets into time trouble, you can try to use that against them. Even if, like, let's say the game isn't going your way necessarily. But especially if your opponent's getting ambitious, but they're also getting into time trouble, that's like a very dangerous place to be in. Because you they want to win. But if once it gets messy, like if you want to win, it always gets messy. And then they're not going to have much time to calculate, right? So... Um, so I had some hope that even if I would get in trouble, that there would still be a way out of it. Mm -hmm. But then once we got to the second time control, I thought like there's no chance I'm winning this because now we're at the second time control yeah. and the position is like dead it's equal. Dry. Yeah, it's like <laughs> dry as as it could possibly be. Um, That's actually what I said during commentary. I was like, if he makes it to 40 moves, then this game is over. It's just going to be a draw. That there's, was also my feeling. There's no way he manages to complicate a position after this. Yeah, it's like yeah. queen, knight, Actually, I thought that maybe Black has some chances to get something on the king side, if anything, right? I didn't feel the danger. I thought like one of us is going to have a perpetual check. Like that's how the game ends. Someone has a perpetual check. But yeah. then he started to overthink things, and I was started to get a little bit like, oh. It also gave me confidence that he's worried about something. I'm not sure what it is, but he's worried about something. <laughs> and and once he gets into time trouble, weird things could happen. So I, that was my hope as well. What about your mind games? What what type of mind games do you play when when that's the situation? Hmm. when you start feeling that your opponent starts hesitating yeah i think one thing that i like to do when my opponents get low on time and this is probably not super great but i play like very quickly as well so it's almost like i'm also in time trouble uh, just because i don't want to give them that extra time to think and you know this has happened a lot before where in games you know i play quickly i kind of lose the edge in a position and then i actually do have to think my opponents relax now because you know they're better <laughs> um that game against alice uh I've yes seen. that was a big one i think also just like i recently played in some open swisses where it's also happened um but overall in my game against anna i think that was the main one where my opponent got into like severe time pressure very early and i just you know i was like okay this position seems easy enough for me to play my moves are pretty obvious um she seems to be a little frazzled and confused about what exactly to do. So hopefully, you know, if I keep playing quickly, I won't blunder anything. <laughs> and uh, she'll be the one blundering. Mm -hmm. That's actually a quality that you share with Begum. Like both of you tend to play very quickly to put the pressure on, I've noticed. Uh, but for her, it didn't work out in that in a very important game against Irina, right? In the penultimate round, because she was also trying to play in Irina's time trouble. Yeah, but do you feel like it's a double-edged sword that sometimes it works out very well, sometimes it just leads to disaster potentially? For sure, because you know if you're playing as quickly as your opponent in time trouble, then that, that means you're like as likely to blunder and miss something. Um, yeah, I know it's also quality of games. Usually, you know, we're both pretty fast players, so we try to avoid getting into time trouble. It's actually like something that annoys me <laughs> about her as a player because I always like feeling that psychological edge of like having the time advantage even if you know it's not a big deal to my opponent it kind of bolsters me a bit yeah it gives you a buffer zone yeah as as you mentioned just a buffer zone to 
stop and think whenever you decide to stop and think, yeah. right? Sometimes it's in the right moment, sometimes you mess it up <laughs> and you get a completely losing position. It happens. Um, speaking of, and I want to take it back a, a few notches, you mentioned that after that draw, you started watching Netflix, not really uh, preparing too much, but you're also going to Stanford. You're also like a full-time academic beast. Uh, <laughs> how do you... Uh, how do you relate the two? How do you combine the two? I'm super behind on my schoolwork right now. <laughs> um, I think earlier in the tournament, though, I was doing a good job of keeping up. Once the pressure got to me, you know, I felt all my energy should focus on chess. But um, in the beginning, yeah, I actually like, didn't prep at all. Um, I would sort of stay up doing homework until like 3 a.m., wake up at 11, um, poke around in my files for, you know, an hour, an hour and a half and so. And go to the round. I think it was only in like the last few rounds when things are really starting to weigh upon me that I was like, I have to prep. Um, none of my prep worked out though, actually. So it was kind of all for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it also like the prep helps you mentally get ready for the game. It's like prepare yourself mentally. At, like I have to fight now. So it's not always like sometimes I feel like I don't get any of my prep on the board, but still. The fact that I did that work, it's like, at least I'm not relaxed and like going to the beach before the game or something. <laughs> but uh, I, I noticed that, um, like, also, I think Jennifer mentioned this, that, like, it was very difficult to combine the two. But you seem to manage it so well, like, you, the, the school life plus the chess life as well. I think part of it is because, you know, difference between Jennifer and I, I know she's been really struggling with the schoolwork as well. Um is that first of all Stanford starts super late in the school year it starts you know late September mm. and so when I came here to play I was missing first two and a half weeks of school or so but you know first week syllabus week second week people are kind of settling into the classes and stuff um so I felt you know if things weren't really ramping up I think for her it was like midterm week mm. um yeah another thing is that all my instructors are super great and you know they recorded lectures for me um, all my homework could be submitted remotely and stuff like that. So kind of managed to make it work. It feels like that changed a little bit since the COVID years, right? Uh, because before, you know, online submissions were not necessarily the norm. Nowadays, it feels like online submissions might be, in fact, the norm uh, in a lot of classes. And a lot of professors are kind of manageable in that regard. Um, it helped us. It helped me, myself, uh, with my program as well, because a lot of my students are... Uh, traveling a lot so it's easier I guess yeah for sure yeah speaking of that speaking of college chess when is Stanford getting a chess program <laughs> I mean you guys have oh had so gosh. many uh, so many good uh, good players you had Narodiski he just graduated you got uh, Alexandra Botas at some point like so many personalities in the chess world went through Stanford Negi at some point Pari Marjan Negi one of the youngest grandmasters in history yeah, um, we definitely have a pretty decent chess team, I think. Um, you know, our first team last year was Bryce uh, Taglana on board one. I don't he's know a GM, he's, right? Yeah, he's a, he's like Did 24, he make, not is, quite is yet. GM norms, I think. Or? Not quite yet. Didn't you he know? reach 2600 at some point? No. Maybe he didn't make the norms. Well, I think, no, 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 I, no. This, I, 2600? I, I, think, I think I got the right guy. No, no, not no. No, Bryce. he hit no, like 2500. Sure, no. Then I he know dropped for sure. 25, yeah. 25. I know he's like 2400. <laughs> okay. That was John Burke. Yeah. No, I know, I know who you're talking about, but I, I, I definitely got. Bryce, Bryce Tickleon is not a name that you forget. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, that, that's an unusual name. It that's is an un unusual name, yeah. No, no, but I, I don't think he ever made 26. No, I, I think 2500, and then now he's like 2400. Yeah, he's a 24 80, like oh. 80, really? I'm not sure. Last I checked. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have him. We have Emily Nguyen, you know, has played the U.S. Women's a yeah. ton of times as well. You know, she's a FM. Great player. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Great player. Um, we have me. <laughs> and then, yeah, uh, we also have, you know, a few strong national masters as well. And, um, you know, actually, I think probably the main tournament that we play is like the Pan Ams. Mm -hmm. Christian, yeah. you go there, of course. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. I mean, you guys have so many uh, great players. You maybe miss one more piece, one more GM or something like that. And you have a competitive team in terms of making it to the final four, making it top, uh, top best universities in terms of chess. 
at some point that should matter right they should support that yeah right? i mean it would be great if stanford had a, a chess program should put pressure on them <laughs> yeah i mean like i honestly think that you know if somewhere um i think a wonderland is also mentioning this to me he's at u chicago um yes. and he was mentioning u chicago also has like a really good chess program actually um not program a team they have like a wonder they have like praveen thought krishna another gm um you know they have a ton of strong players and so he's mentioning to me that you know would make like a big difference sort of to young chess players in the u.s i feel if somewhere like u chicago had a chess program because you know i kind of I didn't end up going to Mizzou because um, it's like Stanford academics. Stanford is Stanford, yes. Yeah, yes, those sorts of, of things. Academics. But, you know, if somewhere, you know, U Chicago, also a grade school, um, super strong academics, faculty, that sort of thing, research opportunities. And, you know, they also have a chess program, then I probably could have picked that over Stanford or anywhere else I got into. Right, right, right. And that's the thing. That's what we're missing in collegiate chess. Um, obviously, I think at Mizzou, we're one of the biggest schools in terms of you know size. We're a public school, um, state state school. Uh, and we didn't even have that before. Um, but we need one of these Ivy League schools to... Yeah. Like close to Ivy League schools. I feel like... Get it, a chess program. It's also kind of hard, though, because you, you would need to be... Um, it appeals to like such a small niche... I feel it's like almost exclusively players from the U.S., mm -hmm. you know, um, and you have to be also like a good enough student to be able to get in and then also join the chess program. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like difficult to manage. Well, if you think about it, what's um, Hui Fan? She was considering at some point going into, um, I think, SLU, St. Louis University. She was close to it, but again most likely academics and the level of academics played into her decision she ended up at oxford, oxford she went to oxford yeah. oxford yeah oh. so she was willing to make this push academically and if you offer her the option of being a part of a chess program and continuing her chess career at the same time then that's a win-win exactly so if we can do that i feel we're not only going to attract the 25 maybe early 2600s but even the top 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 2700s that are 18 years of age. Then, then you need money. Hmm? Then you need money. Yes, but again, if you offer them like a big academic institution and a chess program to cover their expenses. No, no, but, but the push would need to come from inside, right? right? Right. Because you would need the money to to start a program. To entice players of, of, uh, of 20, need, because 2700 level players are players who are professional chess players. You need to offer them a scholarship. Yeah, so a full rights scholarship. It's going to be That's tough it. to convince them to um, either change their path or at least branch out into a different, potentially different direction, right? Yeah, yeah. But again, I mean, a lot of people are starting to see uh, the efforts and and the balancing act that you know guys like you, guys like Icar, guys like you as well. Um, you're able to balance chess, being a chess professional, with some other path, right? Podcasting, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. streaming, yes, I mean, you know, things of that nature. Um, you academically and still maintain the the level that you're at. So I don't know. The world is changing. It, it, it doesn't feel like you're supposed to do just one thing anymore, right? Um, so I think this, this is getting deep, Christian. I know, I know, I know. I, I don't know exactly where I'm going with it. But, but speaking of point. normal life, do you... Do you struggle to get back into the normal routine after a tournament like this? After like a really intensive sort of chess immersive experience like this? Honestly, yeah, for sure. Um, I After, you know, big tournament, especially a good tournament, I was like, I should just quit school and play chess professionally. <laughs> um, then, you know, sort of get back to normal life, writing essays, doing homework, hanging out with friends, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's like nice to be just a normal college kid. I feel like stress, um, chess puts so much stress on me, honestly. Uh, you know, in a tournament like this one, you know, to sort of feel that pressure, it's a lot. And <laughs> I wouldn't be able to play like another tournament right after, same way you are. Um, but yeah, I think my next event is a couple months away. Okay. So that's Which good. one is that? Uh, just the US Masters okay. during Thanksgiving cool. break. Mm. Yeah. And that kind of plays, okay, I mean, 
he's able, I would assume, and I don't want to speak for you necessarily, but you're able to withstand the, the pressure and the stress because that's your profession. I've been doing this a long time. You've been yeah. doing this a long time. That's your <laughs> and profession. And I wouldn't say I always manage to withstand it, but I, I mean, that, that's a big part of it. Like the, the pressure of the event is pretty intense. Yeah. And at least like you're dropping your level that I think that happens to everyone, but to uh, at least maintain as much as you can when the pressure mounts, that's, that's a really big part of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And for you, did you ever feel like chess was your profession or you were still in that period of time where you have the option of going um, in an academic route as well? Um, I think for a long time, I've just been super focused on academics. I went to, uh, you know, a great private school um, in like the town that I lived actually. And so that was always sort of like my main focus. Um, definitely, you know, I was, there were like periods of time when I was considering going to a chess school or maybe like not going to college and just doing chess professionally. But eventually Stanford went out and, you know, I, I kind of figured that after four years of college, you know, I could get a degree or two and then maybe I could get back into chess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Seriously. Yeah. So right now chess is not the profession for you. Yeah. Chess is uh, not really my number one priority, but it's, Definitely still, you know, one of my favorite things to do when I have free time. So I'm still trying to play tournaments, trying to make my GM norms, that kind of thing. What's your um, degree in? My degree What in? are you studying? Uh, computer science. Very nice. Yeah, and then hopefully I can do a master's as well. Are you worried about ChatGPT stealing your jobs? I'm hoping, code. I'm hoping the Stanford <laughs> CS brand is enough uh, to get me a job. That makes sense. That makes sense. I like it. Computers are coming for us. <laughs> they're coming for stealing, everybody. Oh stealing Let me tell jobs. you, everyone at Stanford is going crazy because they're like, Chat GPT is going to take all our jobs. We can't major in CS anymore. Right, right, right. No, I mean, look, at some point they will do holograms of chess commentators. And I'm going to be, <laughs> bye bye. It's over. Well, you uh, need to license your image before that happens. I guess that's a good, yeah. I guess yeah. you can, uh, you can uh, survive like that. That's what they're okay, doing now with the uh, celebrities, right? They're yeah. creating uh, like avatars of them that you can interact with. Yes. That's so dystopian. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's yeah. scary. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I saw this thing on TikTok. At some point, they have this programmed salesperson, hologram of a salesperson that sells you stuff for like 24 hours, 24-7, nonstop. So you have somebody that looks like somebody. It's a hologram. It's an AI um, fed program that sells you products 24 7 i mean but this is like every every movie got it right yeah every science fiction movie this is this I is know. like blade runner learned nothing <laughs> yeah the, how do they know, how do they know I, I don't know good imagination i guess uh, cool what else do i have on my list here oh yeah i wanted to talk about that moment the youngest female player to defeat a gm alexander ivanov in 2000 <laughs> what was it 2013 14 when you were 10 when i was 10 yeah you were 10 yeah uh, how was that? Um, my gosh, so long ago, yeah. <laughs> 10 years now. Um, let me think what I remember. That was a big moment for me. It was like, you know, I didn't realize I was the youngest female to ever uh, be the grandmaster, but it was my first time being a GM, obviously. And I was uh, so excited about it. I was like 2100 at the time, USCF. Um, USCF, okay. So that's yeah. like... 2,000 feet, 2,000 feet. I barely had a feet a rating at that point. I was probably like 1,800 feet. Wow. Um, yeah, but it was just, it was, um, it was one of the quicker time controls. It was like an hour, a little over an hour, no second time control. And Ivanov also has this thing where he gets into <laughs> severe time yes. pressure. Um, he played the modern against me. And, you know, back then I had like no idea what to do with opening theory. I think he was trying to confuse me, but he messed up a little in the opening, gave me some extra tempi, and I just started attacking his king side, and uh, he kind of collapsed after that. And that was a that was a crazy moment for me because you know first time being a GM, I always felt at that point that they're like infallible. You know, mm -hmm, I was like, mm -hmm, I can never be a GM. I don't know how people do it. <laughs> um, first time that I felt that you know maybe I could be a GM if I could beat one. You know, who knows. Uh, I remember my dad and I went to Applebee's afterwards to celebrate. 
like huge win and then <laughs> i had a really bad tournament i lost like the rest of my games <laughs> <laughs> at least the uh dinner at applebee's was worth it yeah nice 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 when did you beat your first year actually you remember i think our stories are almost identical like also <laughs> i was around the same age i don't remember exactly but around 10 years old i was playing Voidkevich, who um passed away uh tragically um, in 2006 but um but he was a very strong grandmaster uh and it was also in a rapid time control. And I don't really remember the game too well, to be honest. But <laughs> I just remember that, that it was like at the Marshall Chess Club, rapid, rapid chess. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a big achievement at the time, it felt like, you know, really. Very cool. That, that first time beating a GM is always, because they're, yeah, they're like these gods that you look up to. And then, then you realize that you, you, can, you can also beat them and potentially also be them one day. Yeah. I actually don't remember that the first time I did the GM. <laughs> Maybe that's why I never achieved this you know, heights. Uh, because I, I don't know, I didn't pay attention. I should have. Hmm. Now I feel bad about myself. <laughs> but you were you were world junior champion, right? I was a world you uh, were? world youth champion. World youth. Nice. World, youth. world youth, not juniors. No, juniors is is tough. Juniors is tough. I mean. You saw how tough it, it was. You had a great tournament uh, and, and, and still tie breaks the not play your way, right? Yeah. I've um, never won like one of those no, the world juniors, juniors so or world youths. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but you, had a, you actually had a tough schedule because we were playing uh, the World Cup. We were both in Baku and then world juniors. And then here, that's almost back to back to back tournaments. I mean, there's some break in between, but that's a pretty tough summer schedule. Yeah. I think like actually right before World Cup, I played like... 30 games in 30 days, <laughs> something mm-hmm. crazy. Um, so I was playing like a bunch of open Swisses, you know. And I think at the end of World Cup, I was like, okay, my sort of like summer stint of uh, tournaments has been over. How's my rating been? I took a look, I gained two points. Mm. I was like, okay, nice. <laughs> a win is a win. A two win point, is two a points win. is two points. Um, yeah, but there was a month long break between World Cup and World Juniors. Um, which is just, you know, exactly what I needed. I don't actually need too long to sort of recuperate after an event. So after a couple of weeks, I was like, all right, I'm ready to get back into it. You're, you're still young. <laughs> <laughs> you still have your energy. Actually, I want to talk about um, the game that you beat the world uh, champion at the time, um, Ju and Jun at the Cairns Cup. I think it was the first edition of the Cairns Cup. Ju and Jun was doing great in the event. Uh, and then she played you with the white pieces. And then you played, I believe it was the French. I played uh, Roy Lopez, but you know, Roy one of Lopez. the weird ones with G6 and Bishop G7. Right, right, right. It was a weird structure. Now I remember. So you're trying to get the King's Indian from any opening. <laughs> any opening. <laughs> any I opening, just King's want, Indian. you know, I'm like, my bishop's on the long diagonal. I'm set. I'm good. How was that? How was that victory? Um, yeah, it was crazy. That was such a, first of all, it was a bad tournament in the beginning. I went like 0 for 4. Um, and I was like, wow, this is super embarrassing to be losing all of my games. You know, tournament's halfway done. And then I think I managed to bounce back. Um, got two wins in a row. Beat Arena, where I also fianced with my bishop. <laughs> so that was big. It was huge. Um, once I sort of got my dark squared bishop along that diagonal, I was like, she's finished. <laughs> um, yeah, it was actually not a great game either. <laughs> and... You know, kind of going into the round against Ju and Jean, I was riding that high a little bit. You know, I was, I'd been previously really down in the depths, in the trenches, mm. and I was back on the ups now. <laughs> um, so I was feeling good. I felt that I caught her out of the opening of this uh, surprise Ray Lopez, which, you know, it's supposed to be pretty unsound for Black, but I don't think she found the best reputation to it. And, um, yeah, I think in the end it turned out to be a good game. There's like a chance that she missed to seize the advantage. And then from there I was able to get a you know, good pawn structure, a good good play on the queen side. Um, and then all, it just felt like all of my pieces were really flowing together and working well. Um, yeah, it was a huge victory for me. I think at the, at the time I was like, it's okay. Because I'd, <laughs> I'd be in higher rated players before. So it's like, it's okay. But emotionally it was huge. Yeah, yeah, you don't realize the the weight of the moment in the moment yeah. only after once it settles. Well, um, 
what I got from this is that you should never let Carissa Fianchetto her picture <laughs> just go B3 so, at move one or something like that. That's it. Well, there's can say half six. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't know I don't know if that'll cut it. <laughs> How do you avoid it? We're going one to have B3. Yeah, one B3, <laughs> knight of six, oh, six G6. G6. Bishop B2, G6. You, you have to throw in like a G4 at some point, you know, get the dark square bishop. Then you'll Fianchetto your knight. We'll like see. Knight H5, we'll knight see. G7. I've never Fianchetto my knight before, but, you know, could be dangerous. <laughs> could work out too. I love it. I love it. Well, guys, congratulations once again. Thank you. Uh, you. U.S. Championship, three times, two times. Two hit wonder. That's that's pretty decent. Congrats, guys. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for uh, joining us. Of course. Thanks, thanks for having person. me. See you guys next time.